Okay, well, thank you. Um, so my name is Stuart, and um, this is going to be a robust and interesting session, to say the least, I think. Um, we are, uh, th th those of us who were involved in uh, organizing Media Democracy Day had it in mind that um, the, the practice of protest at um, various international events is now uh, by independent alternative media. And so part of the conversation we thought would be helpful today is to uh, evaluate what has been achieved and what practices have uh, set forth some real results and what, and, and what have not, actually. And so with that in mind, um, we are very, very happy to have uh, four members of our panel. The idea uh, that we, for the presentations or the format for the presentations are that um, uh, David, Catherine, Isak, and Erwin are going to offer 10 minute um, introductions each, provocations each. Um, that'll take us till oh, about 2.45, and then we will have a half an hour for a dialogue between the audience and the panelists and the panelists and each other, so there'll be lots of time to chat and talk. I'd ask you if you could to use the mic when you uh, come to ask questions, etc. And I'll be uh, moderating to the extent that that's needed. Um, okay, the order for the uh, presentations, the discussion this afternoon are David Eby is going to begin, uh, begin the discussion. David Eby, as uh, some of you will know from reading the speaker's biography, uh, is the executive director of the BC Civil Liberties Association, adjunct professor of law at uh, UBC. He's also president, um, president of the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network, as well as many other accomplishments. Catherine Atkinson is going to follow up, and Catherine is the news and features editor for Rabble.ca and an award-winning journalist. Her career spans 25 years in Canada and Britain, and she's written for a, a range of uh, publications, including The Guardian, The Observer, New Statesman, etc. cetera. Um, Isak Uman um, is a, uh, among many things, uh, Isak is, uh, sorry, is um, one of the, a member of Vancouver Media Co-op's editorial, uh, is a uh, member of Vancouver Media Co-op. He specializes in print and photography, uh, and is, I love this, dangerously curious about video and audio production, which, and this is a good place to be curious in that way. Um, he's also uh, a grad student in my department at SFU, and so we welcome Isa. <coughs> and finally, Erwin Ustindi, many of you will know, Erwin has been a figure in the community, um, uh, in, in in, in the community development world and community politics in Vancouver for uh, some time. And he's currently he's executive director of W2 Community Media Arts Society, um, which operates an artist-run center that strives for cross-cultural dialogue, social inclusion, and the breaking of the digital divide. And Erwin can tell you more about his work. So, um, to begin, let's get underway. David, will you start us off? Uh, thanks very much. I have a bit of a slide presentation that I don't know if the mic's picked up anything. Um, that hopefully will illustrate some of the things that I want to talk about. Um, I want to really, um, I want to expand and uh, contract a little bit. I want to expand uh, the idea around uh, media representations or protests to media representations of dissent generally. Um, and then I want to contract a little bit and focus on um, the Olympics uh, generally and how dissent at various times around the Olympics is represented in um, the media. Uh, the, the opposition to the Olympics, the dissent around the Olympics, and I'm going to assume that, uh, it, which wasn't necessarily the case, that the people who supported the Olympics were uh, the mainstream and that the dissent was actually the people who didn't support the Olympics because at times uh, certainly um, it was arguable that there were more people that did not support the Olympics than that did. But the dissenting view in the media was certainly the one that was critical of the Olympics. Uh, and, and over the Olympic period, my experience was that the dissent was not limited to um, uh, one particular uh, political viewpoint, that is uh, the uh, left or progressive or radical or however you want to characterize um, what's traditionally called left of center politics, um, that it was also on the right, um, that groups like the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, the Fraser Institute, uh, and other groups were concerned about um, primarily uh, government spending and transparency, um, but that they also had um, concerns that um, did not necessarily translate um, in the media. And so there was a, there was a large resistance to the Olympics, uh, incredibly diverse in viewpoint tactics and objectives and, uh, and sort of social strata and like all of these different sort of ways that you can look at the opposition. Um, but that uh, incredibly diverse and 
a large number, uh, in sort of straight numbers, um, viewpoint was missed in the media, and almost entirely. And I think that um, there are a few reasons why this happened, um, and, uh, and I want to explore some of them. Um, and I also want to explore how the dissent was actually uh, represented, and it was represented as being a very small um, and marginal uh, group of uh, individuals, uh, which included me um, and uh, some other folks, uh, some other organizations, uh, and uh, street protests, but it was a very narrow band of people that were represented as Olympic critics. Um, there are some sort of obvious constructions around protests that um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on, and then I want to focus on um, a really effective way in which uh, government uh, managed to marginalize uh, the dissent um, and media was uh, cooperative in doing that. Um, this first slide focuses on the obvious and the one I think um, came to mind first for me and probably for a lot of people in terms of media representations of dissent around the Olympics. Um, it, was a, it was a general equation that was put forward by security forces and then repeated by the media uh, that civil disobedience um, was a threat to security or equivalent to terrorist attacks, that it was an appropriate, um, that it, it was uh, generally listed as being equivalent to uh, some incredibly uh, attacks on people, um, terrorist activities, uh, and they were all captured under this label of criminal protests by the security forces and then repeated in the media. So uh, that quote, criminal protests, actually comes from Bud Mercer, who was the head of the security, and, and Mercer in the article gave the, this list of what a criminal protest included. Uh, violent protests, mass people, uh, I think it was a typo, but I think it was supposed to be mass, mass people throwing Molotov cocktails, uh, breaking fences, permanently blocking highways, refusing to leave, damaging property, assault, throwing things, injuring people, the list goes on. So that's a direct quote where things like blocking a road or refusing to leave are uh, uh, listed as equivalent to assaults and injuring people um, and uh, setting fires. Um, so I think that um, that sort of conflation of traditional uh, civil disobedience, nonviolent civil disobedience with uh, that this would be equivalent to assaulting people or injuring people um, is one way in which uh, the opposition was uh, constructed as, as being a terrorist threat or, or some other threat to the safety of people um, who uh, did not participate in the Olympic opposition. Um, the this, this second way um, that came to mind was um, good world. There was there was a, a tendency in the media, and this is a media tendency to take the most extreme form of anything and represent it as um, representative of the larger context. So, good problem. Um, it's just the the second slide. I don't know if you go back. But in any event, um, that was uh, something, and, and not only that, the media would set people up to try to make them appear uh, even more radical in terms of their. Um, if you just click on this bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it, while you're working on it, I'll just keep talking. Um, the, so there, there was a tendency in the media that I saw to take the most extreme statements around um, either whether it was politics or tactics or around the Olympics and represent it as uh, this is what the opposition to the Olympics is. Um, the worst example of that, I thought, was this, a piece done by CBC around uh, a guy, I think, who was really put in a corner uh, by a reporter and asked, do you believe in this? Do you support this? And then uh, his opinions were listed as um, representative of um, Olympic, I think, Olympic opposition. Um, so taking the most extreme as representative of the entirety of the opposition it was a tendency I saw in the media. And then the third was repeating police statements about the threat represented by protesters uh, uncritically. So um, there were several examples and protests leading up to the Olympics where uh, there, was, uh, there were paper mache shakers with rocks in them that were noise makers that were represented by police as being violent weapons. Uh, much was made of some marbles um, at a, a Victoria Torch protest. We said the marbles were all about uh, um, injuring police officers and injuring horses and uh, these kinds of things. The march, the, in, the entirety of the march was, um, was broadly representative of the community. Um, a, a really remarkable expression of opposition to the Olympics, um, and yet characterized by police as violent and dangerous um, because there were marbles on the road. 
Uh, and this was just uh, repeated without any sort of critical analysis by media. And then uh, an example of that around the GAG20 was the seizing of the crossbow. That, I don't know if you're familiar with the crossbow story. Uh, but this, this happens all the time. And, and media, they'll say, well, we didn't repeat it uncritically. We also you know, got the other point of view and then presented, presented them both equally. But the effect of that, of course, is that it validates the police point of view. And what else are the protesters going to say except for, you know, no, those were paper mache shakers. You know, clearly they were violent weapons. So when, you just, uh, when the media just repeats these police statements um, and then either puts them in opposition to a different point of view, which is actually the correct uh, statement of fact, um, it creates this impression that uh, everything that happens at a protest is actually a violent threat, uh, whether it's a noisemaker or a picket sign with a stick is actually a weapon. Um, one of the more subtle ways, um, I think, that uh, media controlled dissent um, was uh, through sponsorship. Um, the, most of the main uh, media outlets had some corporate affiliation with Olympic sponsorship, whether it's CTV, Bell Globe Media, CanWest, through the Vancouver Sun. Um, and so as a result, had a considerable financial investment in uh, maintaining a positive view around the Olympics. And I was told by a Globe reporter, um, the Globe reporter told me, you know, give us the bad news Olympic stories. We'd love to run those stories. Uh, we want those stories. Um, but the reality was, even if you gave them the biggest news story that uh, uh, there was a, you know, <laughs> there were so many stories around the Olympics, but you give them the biggest news story and it would run um, alongside an entire pullout section about the Olympic torch uh, and where to get your free red mittens and like where's the best place to stand or what are the free events around the Olympics. And so the one article about this core issue, the fact that we're going to have to close schools because uh, the cost overruns on the Olympic ceremonies were $20 million. Uh, and the school closure budget um, is around $20 million um, that needs to be cut from the school board. Um, and that story will run in a very small section compared to the dominating souvenir edition of the Globe and Mail. And so there's this official sponsorship, and yes, we'll run your story, but we're not going to dedicate investigative resources to find it. Um, we're not going to uh, give it the same play that we're going to give the positive news stories. But I thought that the most effective and the most concerning and uh, way in which uh, government actually manipulated media around the Olympics um, was around the unaccredited media center. So in, in the Olympics, there are accredited media um, where you get your pass and then you're bussed around and you're very sheltered and you do all the Olympic tours and all you're expected to file by your news bureau are Olympic stories about athletes and their families and all these kinds of uh, feel-good Olympic stories. Well, there was also an unaccredited media center where uh, newspapers might send a couple other reporters to get the story about Vancouver, what's the city like, uh, what are these, and then other media outlets couldn't get accreditation at the main center, so they were also unaccredited. So this was a potential major threat to um, the positive image of the Olympics, where lots of people had the idea that there would be these hordes of uh, journalists from all over the world converging on the downtown east side, telling the stories of addiction, mental health, abuse, uh, all the horrible things that happen uh, to poor people in our community. Um, and what happened instead was the government built um, and uh, invested huge amounts of money in an unaccredited media center, and, but represented it as a uh, sort of neutral um, media distribution outlet. So, you know, we provide computer services for you. There's a press distribution service. Um, this is not, uh, you know, we're going to tell you stories about BC, certainly, but anyone from the community can apply to have a press release distributed. Um, and then you can use this as your base to file all your stories. Well, uh, they put so many resources into this that they were able to completely control the agenda around the stories that were told. And if journalists were curious about homelessness, they'd, they'd ask around and they'd be told, well, there's an official homelessness information center in the downtown east side that you can go to. And, and in that way, they were really able to control that. So I, I'm going to close by just showing you uh, our attempts, uh, failed attempts, to uh, have a press release distributed about the media briefings that the Civil Liberties Association was going to do over the Olympics through the independent, unaccredited government media center, <coughs> if those words all go together. So, um, <coughs> sent in the application on December 11th, 2009, and then got a response, thanks for your email, we've received it, and we'll have a response for you shortly. Um, so then, uh, thanks for your note, actually, please, ap please apply through the official form on the website. Uh, and we'll be happy to review your submission on December 17th. December 22nd, I get the official response from uh, the website. My request is now under consideration, um, two months before the torch lighting. 
Uh, January 18th, I uh, send a prompt over to the uh, people at the Independent Media Center. I note that we still haven't received confirmation that you're going to distribute our press release uh, or that you're going to let us present at the Media Center. Um, uh, I, I, I got a response from them saying, Sarah, can someone from your team please get back to David from the head of the Media Center? Mm -hmm. And then CC's, it's all very official. Um, they're very seriously considering our application. <laughs> January 22nd, uh, another prompt, uh, haven't heard from you or your colleagues. Uh, we're 21 days out from the opening ceremonies. Are you, are you gonna distribute our press release? We're a community group with a story to tell. January 26th, two and a half weeks from the Olympics. Um, hello, David, thank you for your note. We're experiencing a high volume of requests. <laughs> uh, we're unable to guarantee space at this time. Um, if, you, uh, if you need a firm confirmation now, we'd suggest uh, making alternative arrangements. We regret the inconvenience, but do not want the BCCLA to jeopardize holding its own event. Uh, Sarah, I understand. Uh, let me know whether you'll distribute our press release. Um, uh, would you mind sending it to me again, please? <laughs> uh, January 27th, uh, I've updated it slightly, here it is. Um, February 2nd, this is a week before the opening ceremonies. Uh, Sarah, I haven't heard anything about our press release, will you be sending it out? Um, we're still waiting, taking the gloves off a little bit, you know, we're, <laughs> you know, as, as best we could at that time, it was a very busy time. Um, you know, on and on about, uh, are you gonna send the release or not? Uh, February 9th, three days before the opening ceremony. So, David, thank you for your email. We will not circulate the BCCLA release you submitted uh, to the International uh, Media Center. Um, and they refused to distribute our release, which was not a surprise, right? I didn't expect them to distribute our release. Um, but it, I think it's important to, when government puts out these suggestions, that they're um, willingly distributing information uh, or neutrally participating in a media center to actually call them on it. Um, but I, think, I thought that this in independent media center was a very good uh, example and a lesson that is probably being taught around other mega events of how to control the unaccredited journalists and control the stories that they see um, because that is exactly what happened uh, around our particular release and I'm sure around a number of other stories that uh, should have been told but for people who didn't even bother applying, of course. So um, those are my uh, opening remarks. I hope we have a good conversation. Thanks so much.